Hey everyone, it's August 20th, 2017, and this is your episode 109 of Ep Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me as usual are Megan Arns. Hello. And Ben Charles, how's it going? Hey everybody, I'm doing well. Um, I just had a quick little piece of news to announce, and that is, we didn't talk about this last week, which was the first week we recorded after this happened, but David Maslanka has passed away who's sort of a percussion legend, and we talked about many of his works on, I can't remember what episode it was, um, but our thoughts are certainly with the Maslanka family in this time. Yeah, he was here at JMU just, uh, I guess, back in, I want to say April. Yeah, and he, was, and he was actually here when Laurel was here in February. And then he was here before that in November or something at Mizzou. Wow. So, well, yeah, wow. One of my first huge learning experiences with Gordon Stout stemmed from uh, Lee Stevens introducing his variations on Lost Love to me. And that was, yes, that caused me lots of growing pains. And uh, I'll always be grateful to David for writing that wonderful piece and all the wonderful pieces that he has shared with all of us. He was just so full of energy. He clinicked so well. He, I, I mean, he just, he had so much steam and yeah, I mean, just, I, I mean. Also, he, he had, he had that, but he also had the sort of Buddhist calm wisdom about him too. Oh yeah. It was very pleasant steam. Yeah, yeah. You know, my, it was totally of, very pleasant. One of my favorite scenes from here is Laurel and I actually, our band director was busy. So Laurel and I were responsible for having Jimmy John's lunch with David Maslanka and the students and all the students started balling up their wrappers and tossing them in the trash can. And David Maslanka also balled up his wrapper and tossed it in the trash can like a basketball. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so just a of really, course. really sweet guy. And obviously just amazing music. I think his wife passed away. She a, passed away a few, just a few weeks before weeks, him. Yeah. yeah. You know, I don't, definitely don't know the whole story there, but that just sounds like a story of true love and, yeah, you right. know, you're, you know, living with your partner for so long and, and, you know, wanting to be on the earth and not on the earth at the same time, you know? Wow. wow. Yeah. yeah. So well, you have to that for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ben. Thanks for thanks for mentioning that. And of course, by the time this airs, it'll be pretty old news. But um, yeah, definitely appreciate that. We also have Laurel Black here. Hey, Laurel. Hi, guys. Laurel, you have, you have something of a current event to report, real quick. And uh, what the heck is I Trump? I Trump. So let me tell you guys about something that I came across on Fortune.com this week. Just a quick little article. So musician and app developer Tom Scharfeld made headlines this week as he won a six-year legal battle in which he represented himself against none other than the Trump Organization. Here's what happened. Here's what I Trump is. Scharfeld is an MIT grad. And so in 2010, he developed an app called iTrump about learning to play the trumpet. He previously created something called iBone about playing his primary instrument, which is trombone. And these are like learning apps, music education apps that help you through images and key diagrams and things like that on how to play these instruments. So a few months after he filed the name with the trademark and everything, he received a letter from Trump's lawyers to change the name or be sued. They said that wow. it tarnished, yeah, they said it tarnished, quote, the goodwill and reputation that Mr. Trump has built over the years, end quote. And Scharfeld, knowing that the word Trump is not just a name, but an actual word with several different contextual meanings, he thought there's, I'm just going to battle this head on because I'm not wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. And there's nothing confusing about an app about a trumpet and then a real estate mogul. There's nothing confusing about that. So he studied in libraries and he researched public documents so he could file everything exactly right because he didn't pay anyone to represent him. So for six years, this kind of took over his life battling this lawsuit. And the Trump organization would go from ignoring his requests for documents uh, to later burying him in paperwork. And that's a really common tactic that I think lawyers use to exhaust you into not fighting anymore, to just giving up and saying, fine, I will do whatever you want. Just stop uh, badgering me. But in the end, Scharfeld won every single claim, including every single one, including 
a judge ruling that Trump needed to cancel and revoke certain trademark registrations. So they had basically thought of every combination with the word Trump in it and said, nobody can have this. And then the judge was like, wait a minute, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and re made the organization, not necessarily the individual, um, revoke those registrations. So good job, Tom. It's a lot yeah. of hard work. And yeah, way to go. If I go played Tom. trumpet, I would support you. I'm going to tell everybody to download your app. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. I don't want to get into it, but it, it kind of reminds me of the, have you guys heard about the legal battle between Apple and Apple? No. <laughs> the Beatles record company was Apple Records and Apple Computer has the Apple name. So there was a big lawsuit over it and it was settled that uh, Apple would never get into music. Apple, the computer company, would never get into music and all was well. And then Apple started iTunes back around 2000 or so, and then there was another legal battle over because now Apple had entered the field of music. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, wow, Laurel, thanks for sharing that. It's just amazing, like, of course, yeah, of course he's gonna sue this small guy who made it, this little app, but it's just amazing. After six years, he finally won. And so many of those cases are, yeah, that people just give in because they can't handle the paperwork, they can't handle the fees, and they just give up. I feel like if that were to reoccur again today, at least in certain states, he'd hopefully get one of those anti-slap things where they just immediately end it and say, no, like ultimately this person's going to win. You don't get to go through all the motions of, of doing this and suffer all the fees and, and all of that. I think that's in some states, but not everywhere. Right. To demonstrate to the power of the individual, sometimes, especially in political realms, we think, well, I'm only one person, I can't really do very much. But in fact, in a democracy, as we claim to be, uh, <laughs> we all count. So mm -hmm. we just have to take that power sometimes. And I congratulate him for taking that power. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, well said. It actually just happened, too, to the podcast I've mentioned several times on the show that I like called The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. They've been in a lawsuit for oh, God, I, I, almost 10 years, I think, and they've been taking donations and the the person against them is definitely in the wrong but had so many more resources to tap and they just fought it and fought it and fought it and they finally won so yeah it's good to see those examples well you guys i got to introduce our guest today she is the percussionist with the saturday night live band that's right the saturday night live band the one you've seen and heard about that's been around since the 70s and she's a master gil player and the reason women are legally allowed to perform gil in the dagara nation which is part of ghana she can be seen and or heard with the likes of the Philip Glass Ensemble, Broadway's Lion King, and Tori Amos, just to name a few. So, you guys, it's a huge pleasure and honor to host Valerie Nerano. How are you? I'm well, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure. You're very welcome. It's really great. So tell us a little bit about what's, what's on your plate right now. I just did a beautiful, uh, very intimate gig at Cornelia Street Cafe. Shout out to Cornelia Street because this is the second year they've had a percussion festival. Uh, this is a little club down in, in uh, Greenwich Village. Uh, I'm getting ready to go to Ghana on Friday with the uh, NYU Global Institute of Advanced Studies. I've been teaching at NYU for about seven years now, and it's really an honor to uh, be part of this think tank, which studies the impact of art, music, dance, storytelling, theater at borders all around the world. Um, I am having uh, the National Symphony of Ghana, fortunately, um, is going to be uh, workshopping and uh, preparing to perform my sixth concerto for Giel in Symphony Orchestra. Wow. Uh, I just had a, a very nice, uh, albeit a two-day, ten-hour-a-day long rehearsal with Africa West. Uh, so in, in preparation for our performance at PASIC in November, uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> now we, uh, we just did a couple of days ago our, our second of three weekend update summer editions. We've never been there in the summer. 
Uh, and we have only done a few weekend updates and that is just a wonderful experience. We do it with the skeleton crew. And so there was a lot of downtime. You know, summers are supposed to be times with a little bit of relaxation and buddying up with your friends and family. So the SNL family skeleton crew got to buddy up because we had a lot more downtime than normal. Um, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm about to launch the uh, NYU West African Geal Percussion Ensemble, both intermediate and advanced, in a couple of weeks after I return from Ghana. So a um, few things to think about here, you know, here in New York. That's awesome. Th so I have a quick question. I mean, there's so much to talk about in all of those projects that you're doing at the moment. Uh, oh, but the... <laughs> yeah, I bet. But with, I'm just curious about the Ghana National Symphony. Have you played your other concertos with that group, or what? What, what has your experience been like working uh, with them? No, the, the National Symphony was just formed recently, and uh, I learned huh. about how advanced it has been, um, or how it has advanced. The um, a, one year ago, when the Global Institute, who is uh, this particular. Uh, one called Translucent Borders, headed by Dr. Andy Tierstein of the NYU Tisch School, went over to visit the National Dance Company, which is housed in this beautiful uh, facility in central downtown Accra. Um, so we were, we were chatting about the possibilities. Uh, Ni Tete Yarte, who is the director of uh, the Ghana Dance National Dance Ensemble, said, hey, let's go across the hall and meet the National Symphony and you know, we we chatted and played our instruments and such, and I realized, ah, oh, this symphony's back up and running. Um, so this will be their first time for uh, to perform any of my work. Um, truth be told, it's it's a hard fit. Uh, the concerti, some of them play themselves, I think, uh, and the, the orchestrations by Andrew Beale really play themselves. Everybody's comfortable. Um, orchestrations such from, from such people as Leon Pandarvis, who's a genius orchestrator who, you know, has done the likes of Patti LaBelle and uh, Katy Perry and people of that nature. They, they play much more like a rock band would play. So there's real angular things that big orchestras are not necessarily comfortable with. So it's still kind of a fledgling project to um, to do these five concerti for Giel and Symphony Orchestra. This is probably just my ignorance. Have have other Giel players performed these concertos? Um, Doctor uh, Samuel Gold in uh, in the Midwest is about to do a performance. Uh, Great. But so far, not the the Giel pieces are pretty. Uh, they're advanced, and uh, we're just, you know, we're, it's, like I said, it's kind of a fledgling project. I've had the opportunity to play with a few symphony orchestras, and, you know, it takes every ounce of my passion and more brains than I have to really hook up with a band that's that big. It's a real, uh, for me, it's very cutting edge for, for me uh, to be doing this, and I'm very excited about it. So, you know, we'll see what happens in the future. little related question. I know how to explain what a gil is, but only in a very mechanical way, as in his bars of wood with gar gourds under it. Mm -hmm. What should I add to that when people simply ask what the instrument is? You know what I mean? I would love to say something a little more <laughs> impactful. Like, how do you answer that question? Um, the gil is, first of all, the grandpa, grandma of, of the marimba. So the timbre, the, the, the shape of the bars, the um, the size of the bars are comparable to the kind of mid-range end of the marimba. Let's say from uh, the lowest, not the not base C, but the next C to let's say E or F above that. Um, it's 14 bars, and what I do end up telling people because it's been uh, shared with me, even as late as uh, Friday night, that. It is a study, playing this instrument is a study in meta-dependence. We often call it independence. But actually, and the, the, the term meta-dependence was coined by the great jazz educator and incredible meta-depender, uh, Kenwood Denard, 
who is in at the Berkeley School and is a great freelance artist. Meta independent meaning that you know when you play something on kit, for example, yes, one hand does something, one hand does something else, but they're related, they're interrelated, although they don't play the same thing. So that meta dependence is very, very present in the geo. Um, the left hand plays the harmonic and the rhythmic, puts you in the harmonic and rhythmic milieu. It puts you in the room. And usually, um, as a beginner, there are repeated patterns. As you become more advanced, it'd be like, a, like an advanced upright bass player. You keep the pattern, but you throw in some of your own ideas or your own heart into that. And the right hand then, either the right hand or you as a singer, enact the melody of a particular piece. And then it's up to you as the geo player singer to improvise. So it's very much the format of playing a lot of songs is very, very much uh, the grandpa, grandma of our modern day jazz standard. I had a question about this. I'm, I'm fascinated by, because Western keyboard instruments are so common to us now, I'm fascinated by, I guess, non-Western keyboard instruments. And I'm not super familiar with geo playing, but have you ever played Balinese gander? And is it, obviously the, the motions are different, but is the sort of two-part counterpoint similar at all? I was fortunate to be able to do this with a group called Mega Drums. I've never studied formally, but uh, in 90, 1995, uh, Reinhard Flanschler formed the group Mega Drums, which he did, which at the time he was doing once a year. And this particular lineup was Glenn Velez, Sain, Milton Cardona, uh, and Reinhard, and somebody I'm missing. Uh oh. Well, anyway, so uh, part of that was playing uh, in a gamelan style. So, yes, to answer your question, it is that concept of left hand does one thing, the right thing is meta, the right hand is meta dependent upon that, but it does its own thing. And then in the case of Geo, uh, there are two mallets, and they're held between the, the pointer finger and the middle finger. So, that allows a lot of hand flexibility uh, from the wrist. Think of being a conga player. Of multiple congas, your your wrist is is very much in motion. It's it's creating the sound, so to speak. But then the arms move from side to side. So in, in a limited way, that happens on the geo. But what happens is then between while while the left hand is holding something down and the right hand is is responding and complementing that, oftentimes in advanced play, there's a third voice that comes that is a, a, comp, a compilation of what the right hand can take care of and what the left hand can complement. So it can be as many as four uh, voices going on at one time. So you add your own voice, try to keep your shoulders back, try to breathe well like you would if you were swimming or jogging or something like that, um, and try not to hit any wrong notes, then you know you have a successful piece of music. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's that very simple. athletic, actually, and uh, a lot of my new students are, are you know, they. I, I ask them questions like, "Do you jog? Do you swim? Are you willing to jog?" <laughs> <laughs> because you need that kind of breath control. You know, we as percussionists, we don't breathe. We don't have to breathe to play our instruments, but if we do, take those deep, great breaths the way we would when we're jogging, you know, a mile or two, uh, we would have more oxygen available to us, to our muscles, to do the, the job that we have to do as percussionists, especially as a group percussionist. I remember you saying that you were a vocal major in school. Is that right? Or a double major? Yes, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you're so, that's awesome that you're able to do this. I bet, I wonder if a lot of your students struggle not having that same vocal training or experience with using their voice when learning this music? One of the things I do is try to train them as vocalists. We try to talk about use of the diaphragm. Uh, I think it's very important. Now, mind you, when you go to the Upper West of Ghana or Burkina Faso or Cote d'Ivoire and you start talking about the diaphragm and you know things like that, people just give you a very quizzical <laughs> look. Like, <laughs> Interesting. Just do it. <laughs> what are you talking about? Just do it. No, but in fact, 
um, as, as in so many West African arts, they include the voice, they oftentimes include movement, and they include the playing of an instrument. So uh, I try to funnel, instead of thinking of ourselves as, oh my gosh, I'm singing here, and I'm playing here, and I'm sitting there, uh, I try to think of, let's funnel all of that into the same song or into the same piece of music. So to answer your question, I try to make it so that the struggle isn't quite as painful as the one I had. Fortunately, I had wonderful vocal teachers at the University of Oklahoma at Norman uh, who knew I was a percussionist and encouraged me to, to try to go down that path. Mm -hmm. So uh, the struggle you know, is minimized because, I mean, let's think of it. We use 10% of our brain. So probably a very small percent of our entire life force we actually use from moment to moment. So one of my one of my tasks, one of my goals as a teacher is to try to unlock some of those life forces and get them flowing. Kind of like an acupuncturist would if they, you know, if you went to them and you said, hey, I, my, my left arm kind of hurts and they, they put the needles in the right place and, you know, they open up the channels. So really teaching for me is just allowing someone to, to open those channels for themselves. Yeah, wonderful. Ben, you got a Facebook question there. Yeah, on a on a very related note to everything that Valerie was just saying, we had a uh, Facebook question from Aaron Graham, and Aaron says, "What are your views on Western classically trained musicians attempting to learn and study West African instruments on their own? I love the music of the Jeel, but I do not have the resources to travel to Africa for study, nor do I live close to a private teacher who knows the instrument. What would you recommend for someone like me?" Uh, first of all. Jeel is a very soulful, honking, funky, cool, yet complex art. So what happens to many of my students is they come in and say, well, you know, it's West African music and it's kind of like ostinato. It's a series of ostinati. Well, yes, it can be a series of repeated patterns, yet... Um, when, when, you, when one studies, if one wants to study West African music, one needs to approach it the way they would approach uh, any Western European, West European or Euro-American art. It takes a lot of commitment, takes a lot of practice. Um, and so I, I hope to dispel the myth, even if you're playing a djembe melody, well, let's put it this way. I was a freshman at the University of Colorado with John Gong, and I, John Gong is one of my heroes. He really, he did a percussion program of world music before the term world music was coined. It gives you an idea how old I am. I was born in Illinois. Anyway, <laughs> so even so, at the University of Colorado. Um, Dr. Gong used to have um, always a graduate assistant who was from some country that he uh, was teaching the music from. And in this particular case, the gentleman was from Ghana. So in his every drumming ensemble, I had the chance to witness as a 17-year-old the person who played, you know, box G minor um, Partita, who could do it flawlessly, who was just an amazing musician, struggled behind going, big on, big ding, big And I realized, hey, you know, just because you can play complex things on a keyboard instrument doesn't mean you know how to groove. So learning how to groove <laughs> is it's for a West African, for a, for a master West African musician, it's a lifelong process. Um, so I just want to shout out that grooving is something you you need to, let's say, work with a metronome. Metronomes create a very boring groove, but metronomes are absolute, and and one needs to work with other people. Just the way if you know if you're working on Scarlatti, you you don't say, oh, I understand the concept of that and I'll do a little bit of practice. One must practice. In terms of teachers, 
There are a few teachers in the United States, and we could together try to find one in um, in in Aaron's area. Um, I'm not tooting my horn here, I hope. You can take this out if I am. I'm not trying to toot my horn, but one, one of the things that I've been delighted to be able to do on any weekend, including SNL, including and especially SNL weekends, is that I uh, teach what's called an intensive. I'm now in the bathroom of my five-story brownstone in central Harlem in New York City. So those who want to do an intensive, they come. Uh, on Friday, they take half, an hour and a half lesson on Friday. They stay in my house, and while I'm going to work, they practice. So they might practice six, seven hours before Saturday morning, and then we take another lesson. And then I go off to SNL, go out to NBC Rockefeller Center, come back around 3 p.m., we take another lesson. Uh, then I go back for the night and take a lesson Sunday before I go out to the Lion King. So it takes a tremendous amount. I think if you do find a teacher, when you do find that teacher, wherever they are, it's better to just move there, get a B&B, &B, and, and, you know, do a very intensive study. Because I think there is something about my, my first teacher, Nguyen Babu, in the Upper West of Ghana, um, we had a very interesting first lesson. Because after interviewing me and realizing that I'm a, a, a person who wants to help other people, he said, okay, now you're allowed to study this instrument. So the next morning, uh, we began to study. Um, and he started with something fairly complicated and I, you know, we, when we, got, we, we got far along and Really, in about 10 to 12 minutes, my hands got tired. My wrists, my, my forearms were getting tired, so I stopped. And he said, uh, oh. He picked up his instrument, and he started to walk away. And I said, oh, wait. You know, I was a little confused. I thought, you know, lessons are usually an hour or something like that. I said, uh, are, aren't we going to continue? He said, no, we finished. I said, oh. He said, you stopped. He didn't speak a lot of English. I said, oh, yeah, I, I, I stopped, but I just needed to take a break. So he asked one of the kids who knew English better than he did. He said, take break, take break. What, 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 take break. What is take break? And the child explained to him the concept, the American English concept of taking a break. And he said, he's a really strict, very sweet teacher, but he said to me, no, 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 no. In Ghana here, no take break. And he left. And there it was, my first lesson. So what I realized is part of what GL study is, is to be able the is to be able to manage and accomplish the ability to pace oneself to be able to put out that energy for a long period of time. A typical funeral in Ghana's upper west can be three days long. If you're in a if you're in a an urban area where people gotta go to work on Monday morning, then uh, many funerals start on Friday evenings and they last throughout Saturday and they finish on maybe Sunday late morning or early afternoon. So the geo player in the case of the nations who exist in the upper west of Ghana who are in urban places, that uh, that player needs to have a lot of stamina to keep people dancing for, you know, maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half without stopping until that person's relieved by another player. So Barra was trying to teach me, you have to have stamina, you know, in the same way that a, a, a long distance runner, you need to know how to pace yourself to be able to play with strength but to be able to have enough so when the next you know, the next wave of dancers comes in, you still have energy to support what they're doing, to support their movements. I'm going to start teaching all my lessons that way, I think. Just as, as soon as the student stops. Just, <laughs> all right. Get out. out. See you next week. <laughs> Get out. Get out. <laughs> that'll, 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 that'll help. Laura, what do you have there? Yeah, well, Valerie, I read that you were on faculty at something called the Wula Drum and Dance Retreat. Oh, it looks like it's in Pennsylvania. Yeah, will you tell us about that? That might be an option for someone like Aaron. Wula Dance Retreat takes place 
the middle of September. Uh, shame on me, I don't have the exact date, but it's... I do, because I'm coming. Tell me. <laughs> it's September 16th. Hang on, I've got it in my calendar. I'm only coming for one day, because I'm going to be in New York for a wedding. So I'm coming on for 24 hours. It is... Wednesday, September 13th through Saturday, September 16th. Wonderful. The, uh, this is put together by the genius Michael Marcus, who's a master djembe player and who just takes it upon himself to let other people learn about West African arts and West African related arts as they uh, occur in Puerto Rico or Cuba uh, or um other places, Brazil, for example. The most remarkable thing about Wula, number one, it's tremendous. Uh, the faculty I have learned so much from, and they come from everywhere in the world, particularly the djembe component from Guinea. Uh, and the other thing that is so impressive about Wula, I, I have been told, I don't teach at a lot of drum camps, but um, I have had the experience that uh, drum and dance camps can be kind of ways where the students come to show their stuff. And so they become part competition and part wonderful way to intimidate younger players. Because you go to class and the best dancers show their stuff and the other ones go, oh my gosh, I better just sit on the sidelines. Wula is not like that. Wula encourages rank beginners to be side by side with professionals and therefore creating a more um, authentically uh, West African, Indian, South American, um, human being family concept that everybody has something to share and everybody has something to learn, no matter how experienced or inexperienced one might be. So you have these, yes, there are intermediate, beginning, and advanced classes at Wula, but you can learn something in all of the classes. And the general, uh, a lot of the general evening dance sessions include professionals and their tiny children. So it's really a remarkable family experience. It's set in a very beautiful place with a lakefront and, you know, zip, zip ride and things like that. But the most important thing about it is it's, uh, oriented to embrace everyone and to allow everyone to grow by leaps and bounds. So I can't shout out enough. It's just a, a tremendous experience. It's something, it's really one of the highlights of my year. Will oh, dance okay. and drum retreat. Are you a regular faculty member there? I have been, I think this is my fifth year. So oh. I teach Geo and uh, I hope to be able to teach Native American song and drumming. Uh, perhaps this year. So it's, it, and it's always uh, just a wonderful experience. I meet wonderful people there. People with, well, you know, we, we musos, we artists in general, we, uh, we bear the responsibility of smoothing out some of the roughs that are, uh, you know, that are caused by power struggles of one form or the other. So when you meet a whole bunch of people who have that mission and that determination, it's just a really heartwarming experience. Don't you think? Of course. Yeah, that's really awesome. And and just you know, in addition to Valerie uh, on faculty, I have a couple of other names to throw out there that you guys might recognize. But as she mentioned, uh, some drummers from Guinea would be Mbemba Bangura and uh, Bolo Karakande. Those are two names that um, are big Guinea names. There's also a bunch of well-recognized dance teachers and other percussionists in addition to Valerie, like Joe Galliota doing Ghanaian music, um, Shane Shanahan frame drumming. And there's also, this is really cool. I think there's a wellness staff. And so there's yoga classes and people doing massage and body work as well as meditation. So there, it seems like there's just really something for everyone. And I'm happy to hear from Valerie that it's something for everyone in terms of levels too. It seems like a very welcoming, friendly, educational environment. I actually met someone, uh, um, in Michigan a few months ago, who's taking her entire percussion studio. They wrote a grant and they're, I think taking a van or I don't know if they're flying. I think they're taking a van and driving over and the entire percussion studio is going to the entire, 
uh, retreat. And it's located in, I've never been here before, but it's located in, in the Pocono Valley of the Pocono Mountains. So it sounds beautiful. Possibly did. And I want to shout out um, one of the dance teachers, one of my favorites, and they're all wonderful. But Yusuf Kumbasa is uh -huh. an incredible, he is my dance guru. I do actually teach dance as well as percussion at, um, uh, at NYU. So he has guided me like a, like a little kid. He is just the most wonderful, wonderful teacher. And, and all the teachers there, I, I can't say enough about how, you know, not only they skill, but they have uh, a real um, heart towards allowing people to open up. Yeah, wonderful. You said a few minutes ago something along the lines of uh, artists have the, the duty of uh, ironing out some of the problems society and uh, politics will drop on us. And, you know, you have the most impressive resume line I've ever known of or seen, much cooler than any honorary doctorate or any type of de degree, but that being you, you liberated Gilles and women and music in a part of Ghana. That's um, amazing. I mean, that's absolutely, absolutely amazing. And right now we're being uh, August 20th. It'll be much later when this is released. But uh, the big thing right now, of course, is this, uh, these, these protests and counter protests and um, KKK and Nazi stuff happening in Charlottesville. And I, w I would just love to hear as someone who's done this, hey, I would love to hear your story, but I also love to hear your thoughts on just what's going on right now. If you could share those two things, I would I would love to hear that. Sure. Do you have two hours? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, um, just briefly, I uh, I met Kakraba Lobi's music at the African uh, Records Center in Central Harlem before I lived here, and it just touched me so deeply. I, as soon as I heard a few notes, I felt like something about it was very, very familiar. I can't really say any more than that. So I sought out Kakraba. And at, at the time, you know, you had to write a physical letter to Ghana. So that would take about a month. And it would take perhaps another month for him to reply. But he did reply. And I was able to study with him. Um, I actually went, uh, I, I try to go to West Africa every year, sometime in July or August. And um, I, I have found, now Kakrama passed in 2008. He, was, he suddenly passed and shocked all of us because he was a very strong, healthy man. But um, what I found in my time with Kakrama was a person who not only was a master geo player, but someone who the community could rely upon for advice, for encouragement, for historical perspective, for a little bit of money if they didn't have, you know, if they were in dire straits. And I really realized from Kakrava something that um, I've been fortunate enough to realize through my Buddhist practice that every human being has the responsibility, if they allow themselves to take it, to be a torchbearer for their community. You know, your, your community might be a, 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 on a farm and you might have two neighbors and they each have three kids. So that's seven of you or, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine. Your community might be here in New York City um, Right now, I have friends who are downstairs having a lovely time. I hope it's not too noisy. But um, we use our house as a kind of a community center for gatherings, spiritual gatherings and such. Um, and that part of that I learned through my practice of Buddhism, but a lot of it, too, I learned from Kakrava. That, and he used to tell me that um, here in West Africa, he'd say, we, we musicians, we have a lot to do. We have a lot to do. And I, I really tried to take that to heart, to know that uh, I have to get, as a young, as a young player, I had, I'd say I have to get my ego out of the way. I was always telling myself, get your ego out of the way. It's not about you. Um, yeah, and really, music is not about us. It's about, it's a legacy. 
that we carry on. It came from somewhere. And we, you know, as, as musicians have the opportunity to tap into that history. Uh, I remember, I have to say this, I remember once um, when I was just beginning to study with Kakraba, I went to study with him at his house on a Saturday. And he was not used to teaching on the weekends. So he had forgotten about the lesson. So I kind of sat there with his wife, and she said, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, he, he went to have pizza, which is a local brew, which is a really nice local brew that you can relax with your friends and drink, kind of like having a beer with your friends. Um, and he said he went to drink pizza with, with one of his friends who came into town. So I said, okay, well, you know, I'm here, and I, I paid for my airline ticket, and I paid for my cab ride over here. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and wait for him. And she said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send somebody to get him. And he came and he, and I, you know, he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I forget. I forget. So we sat down to play. And I made some stupid remark about, you know, uh, have, you know uh, having responsibility as a teacher and all that. And he so kindly and so sweetly showed me for an hour that I was a teensy tiny pimple on his, um, on his arm, that I, I knew nothing in comparison to him. He didn't say anything, but I, I got the message loud and clear that, you know, even great teachers can forget, whatever. So at the end of the lesson, I said, Kakrava, I am so sorry. Uh, I've really disrespected you by my comment. And he just said, he nodded and he said, it's okay, it's okay. So it makes me realize that, yeah, you know, we just allow, if we practice hard enough, if we study with the absolute best teachers, my parents used to tell me, if you're going to study music, you need to study with the best. So if we can do that, study with the absolute best teachers that we can find, then we're really opening up a channel that we can carry on that legacy as musicians. Now, in terms of what's going on in the world, uh, music is not only something that we learn and pass on, but the instruments that we play create a sound vibration that traditionally in many traditions, including the tradition of the Jeel, uh, have the potential for creating harmony and balance. So if you go to the Upper West of Ghana in many of the places that, that do study and enact and practice, dance to, write for, and sing with the Jeel, you see this level of harmony. It's remarkable. So when I first went to Ghana, I, it, that blew my mind. I just could not believe the spirit of the people. And they would always say, oh, it's our G. It's our G. It's our instrument. It, it makes us happy. It makes us nice. And I said, is that possible? Is that true? So I started going to the New York Public Library. You know, there's these little concerts that you can do for like, a hundred dollars or whatever. And I started to talk about the system and I started to play it for little kids, you know, seniors or whatever. Um, and, and I said, and I started to realize, yeah, they're right. I had the opportunity very, uh, very also my husband and I had the opportunity to play for, uh, at, and what they would call colloquially an insane asylum. And I was a little trepidatious. I said, man, you know, what's this going to be like? And we began to play, and I saw the most remarkable. You know, these are folks in society that we've called crazy. But I saw the most remarkable people would open up because, you know, they are closer oftentimes. The farther they are from the center of society, the closer they might be to reality. That's a Native American uh, concept of what you would call. If I could, uh, if I could interject here, a, a similar experience that I didn't have, but I've heard about is when Ricardo Muti was appointed director of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, he pledged he wanted to take the music to the people, and he took a chamber ensemble to perform in a prison. Uh, and it was the same thing. He said the the way that the you know these young prisoners, their faces just lit up at seeing obviously predominantly black prisoners seeing black professional classical musicians, like it it just changed their life. So you see, music, it can change your life. It changed my life. I came from the south side of the tracks in some, you know, uh, southern Colorado, 
And my parents were thrilled when I began to play snare drum because it's it's a very at-risk community. But you know, I love snare drum. Remember, what, remember accents and rebounds? So I'd go in my garage and you know, my father said, oh, if you go in the garage, you can play as loud as you want, as soft as you want. Mm-hmm. And it really gave me something to, to, to be happy about when, you know, some of my friends were, were getting into drugs or, you know, things, entertainments that did not build them up. So I, 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 I really, uh, I had the opportunity also to play at Spofford. It's a, a juvenile detention center. And, and it's, it's just wonderful to see how just the um, role modeling and the fact that, you know, we're able to take the time and share music with audiences that aren't necessarily uh, the, the typical audience in a concert hall or in a club. Audiences on the street, for example. But in Spofford, I saw that so many times. People would just, it, it would light a light of hope in them. And I think, you know, we're, we're suffering some of our growing pains. You know, we're a relatively young country, although to, to each individual it's old, but we're suffering the growing pains of, of trying to see what our identity is. And I think just to bring as an individual, without risking our health or our instrument or our life, um, music and encouragement to those places. And, you know, we, there's a lot, it, to, to finish my thought, let me start again. Um, as individuals, to to be able to take music to those unlikely places where people uh, gather to debate uh, and to bring our enthusiasm for something valuable is is really a great thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've I've never had an experience that was less than remarkable by doing that. There's a lot we can do on the internet. Um, posting something. Uh, I had the experience uh, in June because of a freak kind of miss, what do I call it, a a misprogramming that I was asked to perform Haitian music. And my sponsors, I said, I I told my sponsors, "I, I I love Haitian music. It's amazing, but I don't know a thing about it. And they pressed me. They said, well, you're a professional. You can learn something. I put the phone down and I thought about it and, uh, you know, I, I chanted about it. And then I picked up the phone again and I said, look, I know, I know that um, Haiti has a very close relationship with Eastern Cuba. I've been to Cuba three times this year and in Eastern Cuba twice. And I know that uh, there's a, a, a very strong relationship with Benin. How about if I mix some contemporary... Uh, Haitian pieces with pieces from Benin and pieces from Eastern Cuba. And they said, yeah, go for it. And so, um, you know, I, I was, I was having shaky knees at that concert. (laughs) You know, I'm trying to represent something that's much, much bigger than my experience. But I think when we as musicians just rely on those years of training, we've had open up ourselves to the music itself and share it, um, we don't have to be afraid. Yeah. We, we can do a lot. And I think in Western society, we don't share music in the way that other societies do. Um, I'm thinking, uh, this, this reminds me of um, the gathering called the Women's Drum Happening that used to happen in upstate New York, which was specifically to empower young women to, to do what's typically at the time uh, considered a primarily men's art, the art of percussion. Mm-hmm. And uh, they used to say at the ends of our camps, now now, ladies, girls, play at a birthday party. You know, your parents are having a wedding anniversary, bring drums. Um, your friend is celebrating uh, graduation, bring drums. In other words, they were saying, let's bring percussion instruments, let's bring music into our social gatherings. And it's something that we can do, you know, regardless of the weight or the, the lightness of that social gathering. That includes the gatherings at Charlottesville. Now, I, I'm probably not going to show up at Charlottesville tomorrow, but there are places in New York where we uh, 
we're we're going to do that because we need to. We need to. I I feel the conflict, you know, comes from unhappiness. You know, your boss who gets on your case, or you know, your your fellow person in the orchestra who doesn't like you and spreads rumors. They do that because they're unhappy, and basically, it's our responsibility and our privilege to just bring happiness. I mean, that is the essence of music. It's harmony and it's groove. And and that is the essence of what happiness is. That's the sound vibration of happiness. So we got our work cut out for us, huh? Yeah. That's inspiring. It's really inspiring to hear you say all of that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Inspired by great teachers. Yeah. Well, you, you had mentioned... Um, in response to Aaron's question, you had given some suggestions of how people can study West African music in the States. And uh, when I was in undergrad, and I was coming to the end of undergrad, I was one of those people. I was thinking, OK, I'm in the middle of Missouri. I was three hours from any airport. I just felt very isolated. and I knew I wanted to learn more about world music. And so I kind of took it to the extreme and I just said, I'm going to go to Ghana <laughs> and long story short of, you know, how I got to that point, the place that I ended up going to completely changed the way I thought about music. And that place was the Dog Bay Cultural Arts Center and Institute. And our, one of our guests on a previous episode, Nani Agbeli, we talked about the Dog Bay Center, but I wanted to share just a little bit more about that center and maybe get Valerie's thoughts on this center, but also give some suggestions for other places that people, that students could go to as part of a study abroad program or something if they want to experience a culture outside of, of their own and stepping foot outside of the United States. So the Dog Bay Cultural Institute is located in a small village called Kopeia in the Volta region of Ghana. It's kind of the southeast corner of the country. And it's a close-knit farming community, uh, very rural, and it's an Eve-speaking region. Uh, however, most English is the official language of Ghana, so many people do speak English. And in that village, there's a population of about 2,000 people, and a lot of those people are associated with with uh, two different centers. One is the Dog Bay Cultural Institute and Arts Center, and the other is uh, a, a school, the Copeia Bloomfield Primary and Junior Secondary Schools. There are a thousand students in those schools, and they earn an English language Ghanaian education there. And Copeia, because it's so small and so many of these people are involved with both of these institutes, it's kind of celebrated for um, perpetually um, holding, upholding the traditions of the Eve culture. And it's amazing that they're able to do this. And a lot of that, a lot of the funding comes from outsiders coming in to study. So these people, these craftsmen, artists, musicians, they dedicate their lives to upholding this tradition and this culture. And like I said, a lot of, a big reason they're able to do that is because people are going to study. So it was founded in 1984 by Godwin Agbeli, which is Nani's father. He's a Kopeia native and renowned West African drummer. Right now, the center is being run by his son, Emmanuel, and also other members of the Agbeli family. The mission, their official mission, is to sustainably preserve West African and Eve culture by bringing the enduring economic benefits of a successful cultural tourism business to the local community. So the curriculum, if you were to go there as a student, is generally one to two weeks where you would go and you would receive group instruction in drumming, dancing, and singing. And you can also take private lessons while you're there as well to really dig in and further study. Additionally, you can take classes outside of music in traditional crafts. Um, you can kind of walk around the village, witness rural village life and get to know the locals, make friends. You can also visit the beach, shop at traditional open markets. And something that was very, very life-changing and memorable to me was attending a funeral, like what Valerie had kind of described, these long funeral ceremonies. We felt very honored to be able to 
attend a funeral and actually participate in the dancing. Uh, it was an incredible experience. And that funeral that we happened to go to, which I think we talked about this with Nani, was actually one of our teacher's father's. So it was it was already felt close, very, very, very close to the community. And, and, you know, even though we were only there in this village for two weeks, we were taken in like we were family. You know, it was really an incredible, incredible experience. So I loved studying there. I would recommend anyone going and uh, having an experience there. I'm actually taking my students there this summer. We're going at the end of May. So if anyone out there is feeling isolated in their area and doesn't have access to to professional teachers and is interested in having a, a, a life-changing experience, get in touch with me and you can come with us. Awesome. I can't say enough about the Dog Race Center. They are... Um... They're very, very well organized. Actually, Godwin Akbele was one of my first teachers the first year that I went to Ghana. Wow. And he was he was an amazing, he was a force to be reckoned with. And the, the two brothers are uh, carrying on that tradition. I know that Nani goes back home to Ghana, uh, mm -hmm. oftentimes during the summer, and he's oftentimes there. Uh, we at the New York, uh, New York University Global Institute went and visited the Dog Bay Center last summer, and uh, Josh Ryan, who is of Africa West, uh, who I had the pleasure to perform with at PASIC this November, he took a group of students from Baldwin Wallace University in Ohio. It's well organized, um, it's comfortable, one thing that happens in Ghana is the level of comfort can can be a stretch for uh, a person, a traveler who's not uh, doesn't have that experience. But they've done everything to make it very, very comfortable, as well as a primary learning experience in Ibic culture. One thing that I've done um, with a lot of my students, I've never taken a group larger than two people. Um, and usually those people have a lot of experience with world culture, um, you know, so. But uh, and, and I've, I've sent a lot of people to that center because it is excellent. And what I have them do is um, stay at one of the places you fly into Accra, which is the capital of Ghana. And in Accra, about 10 minutes from the airport, is a gentleman named Baere Yotere. Baere was a, uh, he was a child prodigy who was sent to Japan to perform with Kakraba Lobi uh, when, when Baere was about 14 years old. And Baere has a um, facility at the National, um, it's called the Ghana Arts Center, which is on High Street, literally about 10 minutes from the airport. Now, places like Baere's are not fancy. Um, you have to, you know, you have to stretch your comfort level, especially if it's hot. You have to wear a good hat. You have to be uh, willing to to deal with a little bit of heat and such. But the uh, that's where I go. That's where I go to study geo, is to okay. study with Baere, because I will never learn if I if I live to be. 210 years old, I probably wouldn't learn all of the repertoire that he's been able to learn from his family. And um, so what I do when I go there is I, uh, usually I go to the Upper West, I, although I occasionally go to the Dog Bay Center, but um, the Upper West is where the Gilles is from, the Upper West of Ghana and of joining Burkina Faso and Cote d'Ivoire. But what I do is stay at the Riviera Beach Hotel, which is an affordable hotel, which is on the beach and is about a four and a half minute walk to buy at his uh, workplace where he teaches his lessons. His name Sounds is pretty ba good. Baere Yotere. Uh, I think you'll hear, you'll see him on YouTube. He's an excellent teacher as well, a very kind person. And uh, I've I've sent students who, you know, they didn't have really any money. So they said, you know, buy it. Can I stay with you? And he actually stayed with him. And, you know, he's just a very generous person and the source of geo music in Accra without, you know, this is where you would go unless you took the uh, 13 hour trek to the upper west of Ghana, where you'd find a lot of great musicians, too. So awesome. Dog Bay Center, I'm all for it. It's an amazing place, and Emmanuel is an amazing person. The staff is, uh, as you say, they're they're great, they're kind, and you're going to learn more than you can imagine. Yeah, I should mention the other brother that you mentioned, Ruben. I didn't 
I failed to mention him in, in the, my original mentioning of Emmanuel, but I believe they both run the center, correct? Yes, I think Emmanuel Ruben. and Ruben. And Emmanuel is the uh, artistic director, if you want to put it that way. Okay. Mm-hmm. There's some great YouTube footage of the Dogby Center, and I, I believe it's from people who've attended, but just great footage. This one woman put together these a, a great combination of footage and quotes, and I loved watching some of the things that weren't drumming and dancing. She, she had these children sitting in a circle playing some game where they pass these stones real quick around on the on the ground it was really something i'd never seen before and then she'd cut to a quote that was from one of the teachers or uh, or, or from one of the fellow students and it, yeah it was, it was very uh, enlightening really quick so yeah beautiful stuff if you guys are interested there's a lot to see i think if you are going to study in ghana you should do as much research as possible um, and should uh, get get ready in terms of your comfort zone, your sense of privacy. I have. Uh, I think it's very very important if if a person can go to the Upper West of Ghana, get out of the city where things are a little more like every other city in the world, mm -hmm. because just the you learn something about what we call uh, interdependent economics. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a bicycle. I don't have an oven to bake my bread. So, but my neighbor has an oven. So he uses my bicycle on Monday and I use his oven on Tuesday. And you see that uh, among people who don't have a lot of currency, there is really a richness in, in the uh, art of sharing and in the art of uh, cooperation. And music is at the center of that. I mean, people in, in the villages of the Upper West, they not only like the geo, they are absolutely obsessed with it. <laughs> How important it is to them and the sound vibration for the healing and just the opportunity to gather around uh, someone who's deceased or uh, just to have an opportunity to gather once again. It's a really amazing society. Wow, great. So well, thanks so much, Megan, for sharing that. Sure. And Ben, I think you have a quick question before yeah, we wrap, I had right? one question before we have to wrap up here. When I was in high school, uh, I started to get into world music in the form of Indian music, and I got a lot of recordings. And one of my favorite artists that I came across playing some with Ravi Shankar was Zakir Hussain, who I know you've worked with. And wow. in my years to come after that, I discovered that Zakir Hussain is not only a great, wonderful Italian, uh, Italian, Indian classical musician, but also a brilliant sort of collaborator. And he's really, again, respected the Indian tradition, but also taken tabla out of the Indian tradition. And uh, on top of all that, when you watch him play, there's just, I, I love this about him. There's such a sense of joy in his playing. And I know you've worked with him. Could you tell us about working with the great Zakir Hussain? He's an amazing individual and he is a quintessential Indian. I had the opportunity to travel to Chennai for the first time, Chennai and New Delhi, in, uh, in March. And I think I learned a lot about Zakir just on that trip. Uh, the first thing that happened is, you know, I was whisked to my hotel, and I got a little bit of sleep, and then I was given a tour of, of Chennai. And the first thing I noticed was the traffic. It's a free-for-all. Oh, my gosh. I said, I got in the car, we started to move, and I said, oh, this is dangerous. You know, you're going into the lane of the oncoming car and there's a auto rickshaw coming here and there's someone crossing the street and I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Well, we I had a confident driver, but there's no anger. There's no like, oh, you've got my space. None of that. Everyone was just being, they, it was like a dance. It was really remarkable that um, um, in Indian, uh, well, I, I, I dare say in Indian upper middle class society, because that's what I had exposure to, there is a tremendous freedom to create, a tremendous freedom of self-expression and a tremendous sense of uh, cooperation that, that is uh, the example of which is the traffic. You know, you have two lanes and you have to make use of those two lanes uh, why not do so joyfully with respect and with skill? 
And uh, that's the, you know, I had such a tremendous experience in, in Chennai and in New Delhi as well. Zakir is from that society uh, where people have strong opinions, strong sense of intelligence, strong sense of self. Uh, Zakir blew my mind. Um, I was with the group Megadrons, which included Milton Cardona, as I said, oh, uh, Ayrton Moreira, um, and uh, Glenn Velez. We made a record in the middle of that. So who was our producer? Zakir Hussain. Hmm. Uh, a tremendously wonderful producer. All right, we, uh, we were kind of hanging out uh, in Switzerland during our tour. And Zach, someone had, had asked Zakir about his acting career. He said, oh, all right. And he showed us a, a video, which was a movie he had acted in. Amazing. He's a, as an incredible an actor as he is a musician or a producer. I think Indian culture, uh, in, in my limited experience um, in, yeah, earlier this year, it encourages a person to not limit himself, herself. To, to, to go out and, and do uh, as many things as possible and trust oneself to, yeah, no, we don't, we don't start in sixth grade when we go to school. So when you start on a new uh, venture, you start from where you are and open, your, open yourself up and learn as much as you can and then immediately give as much as you can. So that's the experience I had with Zakir. It was an amazing, amazing experience. I mean, he is, you know, I've seen a lot of great, great artists in the guest bands at SNL. I've seen, you know, Paul McCartney and, um, you know, Paul Simon. I have the list, Tina Turner, who's my favorite. The list goes on and on. But Zakir is very, very much on that level of musicianship, of sense of self, uh, sense of responsibility, and sense of sharing. Great, great man. A wonderful, wonderful man who we can all learn a lot from. Yeah, wonderful. I, I think we should wrap up with a uh, – why not wrap up with a little plug? We have a Facebook question from Brendan Caldwell, and he would like to know if you could say a little something about your upcoming PASIC performance with Africa West. I am delighted. You know, I have not found in New York, in Cuba – I mean, I think if I if I looked in Cuba a little harder, I probably would find it. If I lived there, but, uh, and I probably if I looked in New York, I may find. But Africa West is a quintessential dream team. They are accomplished classical musicians. Africa West is uh, Jamie Ryan, Josh Ryan, who are brothers, and Ryan Cor, who is not related but still sh shares the name Ryan. Uh, they've been a trio for a number of years, and I've had the pleasure to know them for a long time. They are the quintessence of what a great classical player does when they take very seriously both Ghanaian music, West African music in general, and the music of Cuba. And so what we are going to do is to uh, do a collaboration a la Kakraba Lobi, who used to collaborate with all kinds of people, but specifically Fode Musasu So who was a core player from Gambia. Uh, and that is to shed all the preconceptions about our traditions and simply make music together from the languages that we have learned. So they will be um, traditional Jili works that are accompanied by the child rhythms of West Africa in, as they are occurring in Cuban, uh, Cuban society, among Cuban musicians. So uh, we, and, and they are amazing to work with. I feel like a kid in a candy shop, you know, on a human level working with them, that they are so accomplished and they group so hard and they really push me, uh, you know, they, they push my envelope. Playing with them is going to be a, an amazing event for me. And I, I, um, we are attempting to create a recording from this set that we're doing at PASIC, and I would hope that that will be available at, at that time. But uh, I, I believe that our performance is Friday at 1 o'clock, that week of PASIC, and I, I am, that will be really one of the highlights of my year, performing with that group. They're amazing musicians. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Valerie. It's really 
great to meet you and we'll see you at PASIC. It's a pleasure and I can't wait to see you again. Thank you for having me. It's really an honor to, to share with you. Thank you. Hey, well, thanks, Laurel, Megan, and Ben. We'll uh, catch you guys next time. Sounds good. All right. All right. Bye, everybody. Catch you at 110.